In this mini lecture, I'm going to talk about evaluating integrals using something called u substitution. Um, so to start, uh, we can evaluate derivatives, of course. If, if I had something like the derivative of x squared plus 3 to the 7th power, I would just bring the 7 down in front, decrease the exponent by 1, but then since it's a function on the inside, I would have to use the chain rule and take the derivative of this function. Uh, the derivative of x squared is just 2x, the derivative of 3 is 0, so that's why I get this here. But since that's a derivative, I should be able to go backwards by doing the antiderivative. So if I start on the right and take the antiderivative, I should get back to the left. So that's what I have written here. So what makes this antiderivative possible, I mean, if we just saw this out of nowhere, I wouldn't know how to take this antiderivative. But what really makes this work is the fact that if I take this x squared plus 3 as a function, well, I'm not going to call it, actually, later we're going to want to call this g of x, then this 2x right here is g prime of x. So the derivative of x squared plus 3 appears as part of the integrand, as part of the thing that I'm integrating. We can use a type of substitution to make this integral happen then. Um, it's going to be called a u substitution. It's also important to remember then how we define the differential earlier in the course. If we had a function y that was equal to f of x, then we define the differential dy to just be f prime of x times dx. Now we're going to usually use a substitution with a variable u. So we're going to say u is equal to some function, maybe f of x, and then du would just be f prime of x times dx. So here's how it worked for this integral that, uh, that we have up above. So we've said basically, you know, if this x squared plus 3, that was this g of x, and then I had g prime of x. So I'm going to take this right here, and I'm going to let this inside be u, and then I'm going to be able to calculate, I see that, you know, this is sort of this related to this idea of u prime. So if I let u equal x squared plus 3, then du, I would take the derivative of this function times dx. So the derivative of x squared plus 3 is 2x, and then I throw on this dx. We're always going to do that. When we have u equal to some function du, we're just going to take the derivative and then tack on dx. That's always going to happen. So what I've got here then, you know, this right here is my u. I should have color-coded this better. This right here is my du. All right, just looking at what we've got here. u is this x squared plus 3. du is this whole 2x dx. The whole 2x dx gets replaced with du. But now how do I take the antiderivative of 7 times u to the 6th? Well, I just go 7 times u to the 7th, and then I divide by the new power. 7 over 7 is 1. But um, the thing is, u was not originally part of this problem. And my, my little joke with this is, nobody cares about u. <laughs> um, but no, really, nobody cares about the variable u. I need to substitute back. So if u is equal to x squared plus 3, instead of u to the 7th, I say it's x squared plus 3 to the 7th plus c. So we see here that when we took the derivative of x squared plus 3 to the 7th, I got this function. When I take the indefinite integral of this function, I get that function back, but plus c. Remember, there's always that arbitrary constant kind of thing. So in general, if I have this situation, I've got a function f of some other function, but then that derivative appears in the integrand. So the derivative of g of x is g prime of x. I can make this substitution then. u is just this function g of x. du then is the derivative of this g prime of x times dx. So now this whole g of x just becomes u and the g prime of x dx becomes du. And then I just have to take the antiderivative of little f. We usually say the antiderivative of little f is capital F, and then we have to add on our constant. Now, um, this finding a, use of, a useful u substitution can be difficult. Um, 
there are usually lots of things you could try to let you equal and you sometimes just have to try something and see if it works or not. Um, in that way then picking the right use substitution often seems more like an art than a science. However, as you see and work more examples you'll get better at picking a good substitution and figuring out how that works. Now if we're doing a definite integral, so with limits of integration, it's important to realize when we have this original integral here these values of 0 and 1 are related to this value of x. So it really says x is going from 0 to 1. So if I'm switching to a new variable u, it really is almost always easier to just take these limits of integration in terms of x and then convert them to u limits of integration. So if x is 0, u we're saying is x squared plus 3. So if I plug the 0 in for x, I just get 0 squared plus 3, which is 3. If x is 1, I just put 1 in for x. 1 squared plus 3 is 4. So instead of going from 0 to 1 for x, I'm going from 3 to 4 for u, and then I make this substitution. So I get u to the 7th, like we did before, but now I'm going from u equals 3 to u equals 4. So I plug in the top, 4 to the 7th, plug in the bottom, 3 to the 7th, I subtract, and I get that big number. Finally, um, sometimes if my function is symmetric, that can help me do some of these definite integrals. This really doesn't have a whole lot to do with substitution. Um, but if I've got this function that's continuous, first of all, an even function, remember, if I replace uh, the input x with the opposite input, the opposite of x, those outputs end up being equal. So I put in opposite inputs, but I get equal outputs. In that case, integrating from negative a to a of this function is just twice the integral from 0 to a. Look at this uh, picture down here. So this function is even. Okay. Um, if I plug in positive x values or negative x values, I get the same y values. This is symmetric about the y-axis. Notice that if I want the total area under this curve, it's really just this area on the right times 2. So instead of integrating from negative a to a, like I have here, I can just integrate from 0 to a and then multiply my result by 2. If f is an odd function, that means if I switch the input, I switch the sign of the output. Then the integral from negative a to a is actually equal to 0. We see that here, an odd function. When I'm going to the right, my positive x coordinates have positive y coordinates. When I'm going to the left, the y coordinates switch signs. But what this gives me then is it gives me a negative area and a positive area that are exactly the same. So when I add them together, I get 0. Now, since the function x squared minus 3 is even, right, if I plug in a positive number for x or a negative number in for x, I get the same value out. Instead of doing the integral from negative 5 to 5, I can just go from 0 to 5 and multiply my answer by 2. So the antiderivative of x squared would be x cubed over 3. The antiderivative of 3 is just 3x. I'm evaluating from 0 to 5. When I plug in the 5, I get this. When I plug in the 0, that's all just a big 0, right? So I get 125 over 3 minus 15 minus 0. 2 times 125 is 250 over 3. 2 times 15 is 30. 30 over 3 is 30 over 1 is really 90 over 3, so I could switch the denominator and I get 160 over 3. Now, if you didn't notice this pro property, you could still do the integral from negative 5 to 5. The thing is, this second um, this second bracket is harder to do than this was up here, right? I mean, we have to plug in this negative 5 and, and deal with all of that. So these properties up here for even and odd functions. They're usually not really necessary. It's, it's not like you have to use them, but if you notice it, they can be helpful.